Well, welcome back to the series. This is part three. Uh, the last one, where? So let's assume you've made your selection. And for the sake of uh, practicality, the choice you made was either Ecuador or Colombia. So I'll speak to those two. Although a lot of what I cover will apply anywhere in the world. Got a number of categories to go through. I'll try not to make this an hour long video, but I'm going to cover this topic in this one video, so let's get to it. Feel free to pause the video so you can take a look at that list. So how do we go to another country? But item number one is finance. Rule of thumb is that whatever you make in a month, you take with you six months worth of that. So if your retirement is around $1,500, and I will be talking primarily about retirement, just to make it simple. If your retirement is around $1,500, then you'd be looking at taking about $9,000 with you to get started. Not counting visa costs. So you can figure probably around 10 grand. Do you, will you need all that? Well, hopefully no, but you may need it so you better have it available. You're in another country where you just can't reach out and figure something out with friends and neighbors. So you can't go sell your car. <laughs> so before you go, plan on that. I needed about a little more than half of that, but I had a pretty good income when I moved, uh, far more than $1,500. So. Uh, you don't know what you're going to run into. My experience told me that where a thousand dollar visa end up costing three thousand. So you want to be prepared for that. Speaking of which, part of the money that you're going to need in Ecuador, I'll say that to get your permanent visa, and it <laughs> it's so hard to give you a set amount. Individual situations matter so much depending on who you see, what office you go to. It's kind of a cluster in Ecuador when it comes to things like this. But plan on between a thousand and three thousand dollars. I'm assuming that my experience was about as bad as it gets and that was three thousand. It should have been about a thousand so make that plan ahead of time. Now coming to Colombia completely different matter when it comes to getting a visa and again I'm primarily talking about retirement right now you don't need anywhere near the documents basically you need a piece of paper that you print off the internet and you're good to go under $500 bank what you want to do is set yourself up with a bank account a checking account with debit card that will have no foreign fees now it may not be the bank you're using now you also want to uh, and this is very difficult, but you want to hedge your bets with a bank that probably won't get gobbled up and bought out by somebody else, which would mean you would have to return to the United States to open a new account. Probably, not necessarily, but uh, ass always assume the worst. If you're drawing Social Security, highly recommend that you use a United States bank and that you have a permanent address in the United States. Do not use as a permanent address these mail forwarding systems. You can. I'm just going to caution you that what seems easy and okay at the time can become a complete aggravation and an expense that you don't need going down the road. So friends, relative, a friend that you can really rely on, a relative, you want to use that as a permanent address. And in finance, there are some of you that are not retired or you are retired and you want to arrive in Ecuador and Colombia and you want to get a job. I'll tell you right now, with very, very, very few exceptions, half of a percent out of a hundred, there are no jobs available for you. Unemployment is problematic just on its own for the people that live there. And then you have all the refugees influx coming from Venezuela. It, it's really a nightmare when it comes to jobs. There's a lot of people suffering. So if you think you're going to swagger in and I've got a degree in such and such, well, degrees are cheap. I know doctors from Venezuela in Cuenca 
that are waitresses. So you're not, you're not going to be the savior to come in with your experience and knowledge and sweep somebody off their feet. It's just not going to happen. Now when I say it's not going to happen, well there's a chance for everything, right? But I sure wouldn't count on it. One thing that can get you in the door, particularly with a travel agency, something along those lines, is fluent bilingual. If you're fluent and your Spanish is as good as your English, then there probably will be some opportunities for you somewhere. I see so many people think, well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to make a living off teaching English. Uh, you know, stand in line. There's a million people that are trying to do it. In Colombia, there's a program to do it, but it's at Columbia Wages. It, it can be pretty good. It's not a bad program. I've talked to a couple people that do it, but it's barely subsistent, so you're going to need something along with it. It will get your visa for you, and there's a few other perks. In Ecuador, occasionally there's something that comes up, but it's really not likely, and if you're going to do it, you're going to need your TEFL certificate. Uh, you're, you're going to need to have at least a bachelor's degree. So it's not something I would plan on because it's not like you're sitting around with openings. Now, the best thing you can do is to have an internet income. Whatever you can do with that. For me, doing these videos and some things associated with it, that's my internet income and if I didn't have it, I would be in dire straits. So you need to have something. I did do for um, almost two years online consulting. My background is in business. I'm very good at it. There's certain things that I can do that people are willing to pay. And so when I came down, I had that set up. Of course, eventually you've taught your clients everything that you can teach them. It's not like they're going to stay with you forever. If you can find something that you can do on the internet, that's great. But be realistic with yourself. And of course, always have a backup plan. Have a backup plan on how to escape if you need to, <laughs> if you decide to return, if you have emergency medical situation, whatever it is, whatever aspect in your life, always have a backup plan. And we're talking about finances. What if this happens? What if that happens? And make sure you got that covered. Okay, second thing, language. What you want to do is whatever country you chose, Colombia or Ecuador, is you need to start right now, a year before you leave, making connections. You need to make connections. You've got to reach out and make connections. You need to make some friends, people that will help you. But having said that, beware of things like Facebook forums because it's unbelievable how much horrible information is on those forums. And people be very convincing. And it's not that they're not a nice person. I'm sure they're very nice people. But they're posting up crap. People will put things on there that they really don't have a clue. Or they know this one particular situation. But what they don't realize is that 99 other situations it doesn't apply. And so it can be very misleading. Do not get your information from Facebook forums. I do recommend that you're on those forums and you're looking down through because what can happen is certain things will pop up where if there's a question and somebody says something and it's crap and somebody who actually knows better, he may post up a link to a government page, for example. So definitely use the forums, but don't make any plans based on the forums themselves. Government websites are a good place to go. Embassy websites, U.S. Embassy websites. Those are actual sources. Whichever country, be it Ecuador or Colombia, I strongly suggest you get connected up with some local person with expertise, be it an accountant, be it a lawyer. It doesn't have to be immediate, but keep your eyes open. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to vultures uh, later in this talk. As far as learning the language, there are free sites like um, Duolingo costs you absolutely nothing and it's a pretty good site. You can get software. I used Rosetta Stone. Ton of work. Didn't help me a whole lot. 
but you know I got this rock head the only thing that really helped me is getting out and having to talk to people and because I do so many things alone then I put myself in a situation where I have to and that actually helps me a lot my Spanish is up to about a three-year-olds so I can be understood it gives people a good laugh you know they appreciate it um, and I managed to get by in pretty much every situation now another way to learn is you can find uh, online there's uh, hello talk is a phone app you can download for free and you can connect up with people in Colombia or Ecuador or pretty much anywhere in the world but you can connect with people there and you'll language share so they want to learn English you want to learn Spanish and you teach each other so that's not a bad thing and you can also possibly make friends although they really frown on it being too social they really want it to be um, strictly about language I think they're afraid that it becomes some kind of dating site and so they'll they'll throw you off there real quick but that's a good place to go you can also connect up with somebody in country and Skype send them a little bit of money and they can actually teach you online so you can have a personal teacher now one of the Venezuelans when I was in Cuenca she was actually a professional teacher and one of the things we needed to get for her was a laptop and somebody donated a laptop and from that point on she was able to make money in the evenings through Skype teaching Spanish for people in the United States so that's also another option do as much as you can before you come this is what happens to most people they have all the best of intentions they go out and they buy 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 thinking that the very act of buying is going to teach them and it doesn't and so they end up with expensive stuff like I bought Rosetta Stone it was expensive and I just you know it just didn't do it for me there's enough free ones they work fine and you have these other options that are low cost or free you really want to try to do it even though very few people actually follow through well once I get there I'll learn pretty quick because I'll be around no you won't it takes a long time I've been down here for three years and I'm barely getting by right and I've had concerted efforts I've joined different groups so I said earlier to stay social it is very very important wherever here may be that you have social connections it's very easy to be depressed to become more and more isolated and this happens in the United States you hear about people all the time where especially older and retired people where they kind of go into a cocoon and they never come out of their apartments you don't want to do that here it's unhealthy it's dangerous you need to have people to stay in touch with you need to have yourself a social network start building it before you come actually actively plan it think about it and have that social network keep yourself socialized documents oh my god I hate this topic in Ecuador it's really problematic for Ecuador everything that you get which is about everything you need to have certified and apostilled critical if you don't have that when certified can be a notary and apostilled if you don't have that it's worthless getting it once you're in Ecuador becomes very expensive every document that I had to get that they chased me after which were three of them cost me between 350 and 500 dollars adds up real quick you don't want to do that there's also long time periods you can wait six weeks or maybe the document never even shows up it's really problematic so you want to have everything before you come and it all needs to be notarized and apostilled and keep in mind it's only valid for six months from the day you get that apostilled if it's after six months you have to do it again so have all your ducks in a row 
you're going to need, I'm not going to go through the list, you can get this off the, uh, the, the government websites, but you need things like your birth certificate, marriage certificate, divorce certificates, yes, it's required. If you're going to drive, you need a driving record, you're going to need an FBI report, you're going to need the state police report. You're going to need, if you're retired, you're going to need your social security certificate. Now. Social Security offices don't give one out. But what you do is you open your account on the website, the Social Security site, and there's a document you can print off. No place for signatures, nothing that says it's certified. But you can walk that into any Social Security office and ask them to please put a Social Security stamp on it and a signature. So you go in, you can ask for a supervisor, he has a little stamp, he'll sign his name up in the corner, down the side doesn't matter as long as it's there. You then can get it apostilled. So you take it to the office, get it apostilled, you're good to go. A whole bunch of other things that you're going to need, but that's just to give you an idea. I will tell you this, there is no requirement for you to bring anything about your education, but I highly recommend before you come to get a copy of your diploma, your transcripts, high school, college, whatever it is that you have, go through the same process and get it notarized, get it apostilled. When you get here, you'll find out, for example, to have a driver's license, you need a certain level of education. Now you need proof, now you gotta go back, and now the expense is so much higher where you can get it in the United States for a matter of dollars. When you get it in Ecuador, it's a matter of hundreds of dollars. Whatever you can imagine, get it. That's the way it goes in Ecuador. Now, Columbia, on the other hand, you don't need much of anything. And if we're talking about retirement, that Social Security paper that you print off the internet, that's all they need. They don't need it notarized. They don't need it apostilled. You just need that. Copy your passport. Uh, some photos for the visa. That's it. You pay the $500. A week later, you have it. I also recommend, particularly in Ecuador, because in Colombia it's not really necessary, but in Ecuador, make sure that you get copies of everything and get that notarized and apostilled. So if you can get originals, if you send off for an, a certified copy, which is like an original, such as a birth certificate, get a couple of those and make sure that they're notarized and apostilled. Your passport, it must be with at least six months still left on it before it expires, or they won't even let you in the country. So if you can renew it, renew it, but make sure that you've got more than six months, well more than six months, maybe a year or more. Now, once you get in Ecuador or Colombia, you can go to one of the embassies and you can uh, file for a renewal, but it's a lot easier if you can just get this, if it's possible to get it knocked out before you even come. But if it's only got six months left, don't even bother. Permanent address, I already covered that. It's absolutely necessary for certain documentation. Back, I actually had two banks. I had a savings and I had a bank, Pachincha in Ecuador. I had Jap and Pachincha. And I had a mail forwarding service because everybody said that's the best way to go. And within two years, I got rid of those because it's not the best way to go. It's really, a bad way to go. This isn't exactly documentation, but I'm including it in this topic. On your phone apps or on websites, there's certain things that you have that will have authentication. So if, for example, you have a Google account and in order to enter that, you put a password, but then you also, maybe you get a phone message that you have to verify. It's a two-part verification authentication. You need to make sure that everything that you have that's connected with your cell phone is switched to email because you won't be able to keep that phone number when you get to Ecuador or Colombia. You're going to have an Ecuadorian or Colombian phone number and so that's not going to work. You're not going to be able to transfer those calls. So if you switch it to email before you come, every account you can think of, go through all your accounts and see what they're asking for. 
if you do it before you come it will save you a lot of headaches and then once you're here if you so choose you can switch it to your Ecuadorian or Colombian phone number speaking of your cell phone make sure your cell phone is unlocked I've seen time and again where somebody comes down here and they got Verizon and they put a SIM card in it and they find out it doesn't work because it's locked you can get them they call it jailbreak you can get that done in Ecuador or Colombia it's not the best of ideas it can work out great it might cost you ten dollars fifteen dollars it can work out great and it can also be a bit of a problem because everybody and their brother works on cell phones down here and not everybody really knows what they're doing and they can kind of mess up your cell phone get it done before you before you leave if you can't get it done if it's problematic it'll be problematic here last thing in this category is the step program step check with the u.s embassy basically it's a program you sign up for and you'll get any kind of updates or warnings but you're on the list also once you arrive in the country in colombia or ecuador go to the embassy and register with them or you can do it by phone or email depends whatever the situation is but get yourself registered where you live you know basic information so that if something ever happens they can go to bat for you they can help you with it but if there was any kind of national emergency something terrible happened like the people were living on the coast when the earthquake hit a few years ago it can become important so you know consider that flights what do I do with flights when you go to another country they require proof of round trip or a ticket to move on so you're, you're going initially on the free 90-day visa it's just a stamp in your passport at the airport they want to know that you're not flying in and plan to just stay there illegally because contrary to popular opinion other countries are very very strict on immigration and they don't permit anything like what goes on in the United States don't mess around with them don't step on any toes so if they have a requirement to show you're either going to Ecuador for example but you're moving on to Colombia you need to have a ticket to show that or if you're going to Ecuador you need to have a ticket showing that you're going to return to the United States one or the other I didn't know at the time that it doesn't have to be a return flight on your plane ticket although most plane tickets if it's one way or if it's return flight the price usually isn't that much different uh, strangely enough in which case go for it you get a bus ticket you can get a bus ticket online you drop 20 bucks to go to the border so you don't have to have that expensive round trip vultures I have to talk about vultures this is a big beware new people if you, if you go to the Facebook forums where so many people go and you'll watch somebody post up a question about rentals or a housing or a visa you will see a ton of people pounce on them I'm looking for a rental in Cuenca well I got this place on the coast for rent and all these people will inundate them with these things and they sound so nice and they're so helpful it's how they're making a living now, I don't hate them for that but you're a target and most of those are going to try to sweep you up because you don't know any better and get more money out of you than you should be paying in rentals you'd be paying double I see all the time somebody in particular won't even bring up a name but somebody talks about rentals for three or four hundred dollars and this person will jump in and say oh that's ridiculous and don't be such a penny pincher and why do you want to live in squalor you know get yourself a good place don't listen to them and I can get you hooked up you know seven hundred dollars or something and yeah except he's getting you hooked up for seven hundred dollars for something that costs 350 it's it's not helpful and I'll see I've talked to a couple people that said well it's worth it to me to have somebody hold my hand and walk me through it really isn't because you're stuck paying for that for at least a year 
That's some serious money. You want somebody to hold your hand, you can get that for far, far less. A couple hundred dollars will give you a couple weeks of somebody to hold your hand. So don't do that. Be, where are the vultures? The worst vultures are other gringos. <laughs> I swear they're the worst ones. But here's the biggest trap. I'm bilingual. I speak English. I can help you with this. Those are kind of the biggest scams. Not always, but their skill tends to be more in the fact that they can speak English than in what it is that they're supposed to be doing for you, be it visa work or, you know, rentals. That's not the way you want to go. Beware of the vultures. And I'm generalizing, but in general, the better way to go with these kinds of things are with local people that aren't necessarily bilingual. Rather than get ripped off for large amounts over a period of time, it would be better for you to hire yourself a representative for you that's a translator and pay them 20 bucks a day or something along those lines, 30 bucks a day, to spend a few days to take care of these things for you with a local person who may not be bilingual. So it's something to consider. You don't really need to be a target. I would prefer to have someone with more expertise than someone who can speak my language. Healthcare. You need to have something. And I'm not talking about whatever the laws are. I'm talking about for your own sake. You need to have something. What is that going to be? Is it going to be $15,000 setting in a savings account somewhere that if you get sick you can buy your way through? That's fine. Without going into detail on this, you can do the detail, you can do the legwork, but healthcare in Ecuador, for example, is really kind of problematic. The IESS, which is their version of the Social Security system, which covers uh, a medical, it covers retirement, there's a series of things uh, that it does, but it's essentially, it's bankrupt. It's running in the hole, $4 billion a year, it amounts to about 10% of the national budget that goes down the rabbit hole. So how long, that, it's not sustainable. And so if you sign up for that, is it going to be two years, three years, four years before it's no longer there for you? It's something to consider. Maybe they'll figure it out. Maybe they'll work it out. It certainly is going to have to be charging more and more and more because it's a governmental one payer system those are always more expensive because you've got so many layers of bureaucracy. When I first went to Ecuador, it was around $67 a month for one person. It's already double, triple that amount. And again, there are people with different situations, so don't take any of those numbers as gospel. But it's something to consider. It's something for you to look into. The private insurance companies in Ecuador are really problematic because the rules and regulations for them are practically non-existent. They're easily ignored and a lot of the programs that will be available this year will be bankrupt next year. One of the biggest ones, which a lot of people saw come to, coming for several years, but it was really good at hiring English-speaking people and so a lot of gringos got caught up in it. They, tr they, they quadrupled their rates over a period of a, a couple months and then they absconded with the money and went out of business. It, you're just left holding the bag. You do not have to have a health insurance that originates in Ecuador. Some people on the internet will talk about, well, there's an approved list. It's not really an approved list because there's no criteria. All it is is a list of companies that exist in Ecuador. It doesn't mean you can't use something from somewhere else as long as it can operate in Ecuador. So they can, they can pay that bill for you. But the way those will usually work, including the, program, the private programs in Ecuador, is that you go in, you pay for whatever service you have, and you get a reimbursement. With the Ecuador systems, cross your fingers and hope you get reimbursed. I mean, just being honest with you. 
you really need to do some digging and feel comfortable and just beware of salesmen that talk you into something because in Ecuador they don't have the kind of regulations that you're used to they can just kind of lie to you and get away with it because in the end what are you going to do about it it's not like they have anybody you know policing them so you know use some caution Colombia it's a whole different ball game you've got a a government monitored system but it's private therefore you don't have one payer system you've got like in Armenia I've got like a dozen choices they're all for me under forty dollars a month they cover everything and they run at a profit because they're private they don't have layers of bureaucracy which double triple quadruple the cost when you have that bureaucracy then it leads to various corruptions it just doesn't exist so you have that pre-existing conditions don't matter then you also have private that are usually sold as add-on so you might get you might get a single room instead of two people in a room or you might have TV privileges or telephone privileges or better upgraded meals uh, ambulance costs so it's more along the lines of you're buying into some extra perks I mean in some hospitals you can get a special suite you know if you want to pay another couple hundred dollars a month then you can get pretty much whatever you want to have in the basics uh, depending on the insurance company that $37 you might be able to upgrade that in that program and maybe pay sixty, eighty, ninety dollars and get a lot of those extra services also. Again, because everybody's situation is different, these are things that you need to find out for your particular situation, your particular needs. And I recommend that you make contacts in whatever country that you can rely on to track this down for you. Last thing, should I ship or should I sell? my advice sell everything come down with some suitcases that may not work for everybody again depends on your situation but it's expensive to ship first of all now you can spend up to ten thousand dollars with a shipping container what if in a year you decide that you don't want to be here anymore now what do you do with all your stuff personally i had a lot of stuff i sold everything it took me three four five months but I sold everything it took me three months to decide what to pack in my suitcase I packed and unpacked so many times it was ridiculous I kept whittling it down whatever you think you need you, you need to modify that then when you arrive you can start you can use the money for the things you sold and you can start building your life back up but you're gonna find that there were so many things that you had in the United States that you really don't need and they're more of a burden now again that's not for everybody if you have a big family you're coming down here you got three or four kids you might want to bring all that stuff just to save you a lot of time and effort and in Ecuador's case a lot of money because a lot of household things can be pretty expensive as compared to the US in Colombia it's actually cheaper for pretty much everything so again depends if you're single by all means really seriously think about just selling off everything if it's just you and wife girlfriend or whatever partner you have probably say the same thing just sell what you have come down with minimum suitcases now I, I knew one guy who his most of his life was in his workshop and he had a very extensive amount of tools I mean it wasn't like a small workshop it was almost like a mini factory and he shipped all that down well of course of course he would do that that makes sense because that has that's his life's meaning so in cases like that of course that makes sense that's it for today if you're still with me congratulations I can't believe it we've got a few more sections to go uh, I believe three more and then we'll be done with this series when you're watching these videos there'll be notices that'll flash some will be for the GoFundMe Patreon but I also if I've done videos in the past that maybe have more or different information 
wherever it is I'm talking about, that advisor may pop out and it might be something that you want to look into. But I don't know, is it here or is it here? I'll figure it out. See you next one.